Oliver Smith was born in Sydney in 1974 and grew up in the central west of New South Wales. Acknowledged as an innovative and skilled silversmith specialising in hot forging, he comes from generations of jewellers and metalsmiths, including makers of armour. After graduating first in 1995 with a Bachelor of Visual Arts from Sydney College of the Arts, he elected to follow up with work experience as a journeyman and trainee silversmith with leading gold and silversmiths in Australia and overseas. He then specialised in hot forging and making flatware for the dining table and he was awarded first class honours in 2000 and a Master of Philosophy in 2003 through the ANU School of Art Gold and Silversmithing Workshop. Oliver is currently a lecturer in the Sydney College of the Arts Jewellery and Object Design Studio and is also a member of the Board of Directors of Object Australian Design Centre. Okay, over to you. Okay, lots to cover in 20 minutes. Uh, I want to deliver an epic saga, so 20 minutes is tough, uh, and together we will traverse the globe, uh, we'll travel through time, we'll view treasures, uh, look with wonder at the vitality of matter, and consider the agency of the non-human, and also grapple with supernatural forces. Uh, referencing, in my imagination, at least uh, Jane Bennett's uh, vibrant matter, sort of new materialism, uh, key text. This is an image taken with a camera moving accidentally. It's a happy snap, but a happy accident uh, of a uh, Viking silver hoard. So this is pirate treasure. And what I really like about this stuff is there's coins from all over the place. And there's silver ingots there that I could grab with my tongs take and heat up and keep working. So this sort of uh, idea of the vitality of matter, uh, materials that can be transformed through processes of making, it doesn't stop when the maker steps back. It's sitting there ready to uh, move ahead in another time and place. I haven't timed this, so I might be uh, jumping all over the place, but I think it's okay. I'm uh, seven weeks into the PhD, and so a lot of these ideas are flying around, and it's a little bit like the floodgates have opened, and all sorts of connections uh, are taking place, so I'm going to uh, play it fast and loose. In January of 2011, my understanding of materials and making was transformed by three museum visits. Through this experience, my awareness of the connections between humans and animals grew, and I became more mindful of the agency of matter as activated through processes of making. This in turn raised questions regarding the relationship between the tool and the talisman, and this rekindled my interest in symbols, their origins, and their contemporary role. And thus my uh, current research trajectory was formed. So here we are at the doors of the National Museum of Denmark, and I was waiting eagerly for them to open, and you can see just the second door opening there and a figure disappearing. They just unlocked and I was ready to roll in. And there was a lot of metal work that I really was excited to see in there, stuff I'd seen in textbooks for years and was uh, so excited. So this is a, uh, some uh, Bronze Age helmets, the Vixo helmets. The whole lot of this stuff sort of came to light uh, around the turn of the last century, so uh, the 1880s, 90s and uh, early uh, 20th century. And these are fabulous, these helmets. They've got these sort of bovine horns and these eagles' uh, beaks and eyes on them. And here's another one, the Sun Chariot, another sort of uh, Bronze Age uh, object. So it's sort of the horse on it's about this big. And the wheels work, so it would be sort of a, something that would be led out as a procession. So we've got this sort of animal and all that, also this celestial body, the sun behind it. And this is a great one. This is the uh, Gundestrup cauldron. And it's really big sort of uh, vessel. Uh, it was uh, unearthed in the Raver Mosen Bog near Gundestrup in Himmeland in 1891. And it's sort of an exemplar of Iron Age silversmithing and the origin's been contested because there's all sorts of cultural references and aspects of costume from throughout uh, Europe. 
technically they uh, make uh, a connection to Thracian silversmiths, so uh, there's also the impact in terms of that cultural exchange of the Roman Empire. But interestingly, you can sort of see some of these things on there. There are lots of figures all over it. So there's animals and humans, and there's these sort of strange divinities that are part animal, part human, uh, and also mythological beasts that are made of this sort of amalgam of different animals. OK, so uh, you mentioned the sword. I'm not going to go into this any sort of depth on the sword. I'm going to talk mainly about hammers and axes and things, uh, but the sword's quite an interesting one because of, uh, even though it's this sort of uh, weapon and the blade and there's sort of uh, certain sorts of uh, atmospheres around that, it also sits in this symbol of justice <laughs> and uh, nobility and goodness, which is sort of a strange uh, uh, idea there. But anyway, I'll talk about some of the aspects of metalwork, but not so much the sword, but this is sort of Viking Age stuff, and I really like... Uh, what I see when I look at this uh, work is that the people who made it weren't in the medieval period where you became specialised and you worked particular materials and the context with which the work uh, was made was very well established. Uh, I think the people that were making the tools were also making the jewellery and there's something sort of about the directness or uh, expression of the material quality through the making that comes throughout that sort of exchange. And a uh, horse harness, I thought I'd include that as a reference to the... Uh, so we've got to get some metal and bones together, but also Madeline uh, speaking before me. OK. So I'll slow down a little bit now. Now, I was really excited when we got uh, into this. I was there with my wife and son at the time. Uh, seeing the sheer volume that was on display here and the, I didn't realise it and I've been in correspondence with uh, curators that worked on the latest display which came together in 2008, but it's taken about 25 years to get to this, it's been a really long project, but the sort of curatorial work behind it really was effective, but I didn't, I've only just realised that in the last six months, but it really spoke very directly to me through the volume, the excellent glass display cases and the connections I could make between things. So th this point about the people that made these, we've got tools over here for making, so there's tongs you can just see on the edge, we've got weapons here, particularly those axes are of interest, and then we've got uh, symbols or charms, and so Thor's hammer and variety of sort of talismanic objects up the top, so there's sort of this, even within the uh, talismanic space, this connection to the tools and making. Now the display uh, was set out in this chronological manner, and I went straight to the Viking Age stuff, because that's what I wanted to see first, and then I started moving backwards, and I could see the Viking Age connecting to the Iron Age, the Iron Age connecting to Bronze Age, and then I got to the uh, juncture between metalwork and stone. And my interest, being a silversmith, is in metal, and so that sort of 5,000 years of history is where I sort of uh, have focused. And when I got to see uh, this juncture, there were a couple of these uh, particular objects that were stone moulds made for casting early uh, metal blades or axes or adz uh, forms. And suddenly I went, wow, this is... Uh, I'd always thought of metal the way it was made as being referencing what those materials could do, what metal could do. Uh, but suddenly I could see, OK, this stone form language was really informing those early metal objects. More on that in a second. So these are some bronze uh, axes. I'm going off on a tangent here. Uh, and they're really large, so they're ceremonial, sacrificial objects. And so they're kind of like the axe symbol taken to the nth degree. So they're not functional at all. You've carried around and they'll chucked in a bog to appease the gods or for whatever uh, reason. But they're sort of uh, an expression of that technical process of making taken to that uh, really heightened state. If we step uh, back from that, you can see this sort of... Uh, the flare of the blades here and then coming down to sort of smaller versions of them, how that sort of exaggerated quality in those ceremonial offerings uh, grew. And then if we take another step here, this is interesting from my point of view, we've got uh, in the centre and over there where there's sort of the green speckled forms there, they're all stone axe forms, but again, 
to a scale that just sits on the edge of the functional, so they would have a symbolic uh, purpose as well. And then we get over here on the right, they're actually bronze uh, cast axes, so that there's embellishments which you can see on the sacrificial offering, but we see the form language coming straight out of the stone. And here we've got uh, a transition of a couple of different sort of stone tools. We can see the flaking of uh, flint work and getting those sort of uh, really crisp, sharp edges. But we also see the grinding up the top of stone forms, which to me that's very evocative of a forged uh, metallic form, the way the blade uh, flares out. So I, I suddenly could see in the way that the exhibition had been laid out, the collection and the chronological timeline, I was moving backwards, I suddenly went, wow, all of this metal stuff, it just was this direct development of how people were working with stone. And then I started looking at napping and thinking about striking uh, metal. Then I started thinking about uh, heat treatment and that you take actually sticks and bones and you char those and you can uh, harden the actual end of those uh, tools or implements. And then similarly, if you're sort of heating up this sort of stone uh, material and then there's uh, minerals or ore that you then try that out with. And you, so there's all this sort of exchange of process and things moving backwards and forwards. Now, if I jump right up and go to uh, back to this sort of metallurgical processes, I started thinking about the purification of molten metal in the crucible. Uh, the crucible itself opens up the whole realm of ceramics, so that's sort of a, another sort of parallel that exists there. And even uh, puri the purification of the molten metal in the crucible, often you use uh, charcoal or green timber, and that, in a way, uh, can bring in the idea of steel and adding carbon to iron to create that uh, alloy. Uh, and then we get a little bit to the sword sort of space over here, David, the mythologically charged process of hardening, tempering, steel that sort of centres on the hearth, so this application of heat and fire. Now, if we keep expanding this process of one way of making informing the other uh, and the application of uh, a pre-scientific mode of testing things out, uh, it's, it's sort of the foundation, the bedrock, rock's a good term in this sort of context, that we build up and we sort of eventually arrive at the alchemist workshop so the idea of all of the sort of agency of matter and the different elements and how they move and interact with each other. And the, moving forward into the contemporary context, the chemist's laboratory and also into the realm of the physicist. So this is uh, understanding what the world is through interacting with it. So the agency of matter, seeing that it was a, uh, a dialogue, to me, is evident. So these were some of the uh, copper uh, blades that were made in those stone moulds. So they're sort of sitting between the form language of metal and the form language of stone. And here we've got a whole lot of, uh, you know, the sort of classic ads form uh, with the sort of, they'd have a hook timber handle and then would be bound to that and that's sort of a you know, universal implement that came to uh, prominence. But they're very much like a tooth or a limb, the way that, that you'd work with those. So there's a real gesture embodied in those objects. And here we've got a whole range of the uh, different uh, sort of napping processes. Now if we consider anthrop the sort of anthropological uh, realm, we are all familiar with it sort of uh, being aligned traditionally to uh, evolutionary thinking in quite a simplistic way. We know from a uh, new materialist perspective that it's hugely problematic, particularly from an ecological point of view, to see this sort of uh, ascent of man as this heroic quest through technology of mastering nature and uh, taking control of your own existence. We know that's flawed. Uh, and I think that sort of uh, clear pathway, the linear reading, is also flawed. What I'm trying to suggest by moving from the stone into the metal is not that we got to a better material, it's just that our only way to try some other material out is through what we've uh, already played around with. So one experiment leads to another. And if we sort of operate in that realm, we see all of these different ways of making things, all of these different materials and their uh, working properties 
their capabilities under certain circumstances as informing each other, and that becomes much more dynamic. So then the uh, heroism, there's something interesting about that heroic quest applied to the old anthropological model. We know it's flawed, uh, but the heroism is in the curiosity and the experimentation, and that's something as artists I think we can all really embrace. Yeah, how are we going time-wise? Okay. So the correlation between human evolution and the development of culture as a heroic struggle against the wild forces of nature is an outmoded concept in anthropology. Yet we are aware that it has played a role in shaping this field and it is an idea that informs our understanding of technology. So I was trying to tease out tech, what we sort of think of as technology and offer new uh, insights into that. And it made me think that a more fluid uh, definition of technology allows us uh, a greater conceptual freedom and we can look to the inspiration of certain tools and their relationship to the symbolic. So I've got between metal to stone, and we're about to make a big step here and connect to the animal. So in the National Museum of Denmark and Copenhagen, we've got these two brilliant skeletons. So we've got the aurochs and an elk here. I'm going to let the elk go after this. We'll concentrate on the aurochs today. And it's this uh, wild bovine, so this big wild cattle uh, species that's now extinct. Uh, that lived sort of throughout Europe, sort of a connection to the megafauna of the Ice Age. And they were uh, a sort of a primary uh, animal to hunt and therefore uh, sustain a population during the Ice Age. But also they were obviously worshipped uh, because of their uh, vigour and vitality. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. But anyway, you go into the museum and I'd sort of come back through the Stone Age uh, and then I sort of arrived at the entrance to that, which was uh, these two skeletons, and alongside them were the uh, tools or implements used to hunt them, and that the culture that existed around these uh, animals uh, inspired, but also talismanic objects. So here we've got a little amber bear and a horse, and I just reduced it, and it's a bit sort of hazy, but I think that's okay. I've used all my happy snaps today rather than the... Uh, official sort of uh, archaeological images because I want your imagination to fill in the gaps, particularly when we get further down the track. Um, so we've got these sort of talismanic objects. So we could suddenly see that this animal was inspiring this uh, representation as a miniature to distill what it was, but also I could see through the tools and the skeleton the same form language taking place. And the form language there related back into the stone. And then I started thinking about these uh, humans observing these animals, not as static beings, but as dynamic forces. And so the horns, the hooves, the teeth, all of the animals, that sort of uh, interaction through nature, they were seeing them as alive and seeing them do things. And in the doing, suddenly the, the physique, the skeleton, became this thing that was in action. And so a whole lot of inspiration for the tools. I could see this. I've got to talk to... Uh, archaeologists and anthropologists to develop this theory across the PhD, but I could see this was through the form language again and again repeated, and we can come back to some of those Viking Age things and I can trace these lines back to these uh, forms. Now, interestingly, the collection and the display, even though I was green to it at the time, it worked and it did it, and it, it's actually a really uh, important museum in the sense that uh, Leap ahead here. This is an image of archaeologist Christian Jurgensen Thompson, who lived from 1788 to 1865, and he was, uh, you know, a key figure in developing this museum. And he's also the guy that created the three material uh, definition of archaeology. So he's got the Bron uh, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. He made that up as a way to deal with the collection that he had that had come through the royal family of Denmark. So we've got this sort of strange idea of the nobility looking back and creating cultural history and national identity, which we talked about where a lot of those finds occurred. You can see that moment in time, sort of within the colonial period. There's all this sort of stuff at play. And he also took the collection and created that uh, terminology, the three stages. Uh, and he also got that collection to become this sort of national uh, institution. So the museum came into being through this figure. I'm not going to talk too much more about him, even though he's very interesting. Uh, did some really great work in terms of the development of uh, an ethnographic museum, and again, he was a sort of uh, groundbreaker in that space as well. 
But looking back at all of that from the point of view of materiality, we're sort of dividing things up. There's another tangent I'm not going to go on today as well, which is there's a whole lot of other material that existed that doesn't last. So stone is really great because it's around for a long time in its sort of form, whereas I think uh, the reference I've got in my paper is uh, Otzi, the Iceman, who had 18 different types of timber on amongst the uh, equipment that he was found with, sort of a corpse in the Alps between Italy and Austria, and all the different timbers were used for different working properties. So the sort of the material knowledge, because the t stone tools are phenomenally uh, well made, uh, all of that material knowledge applied to all sorts of other materials as well. Beeswax would definitely be included there. Okay, so the, a couple of days later, I travelled to the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art, which is also in uh, Denmark, and uh, it was winter at the time, so it looked a bit more in that sort of zone. Um, and it's the uh, 20th century canon, uh, contemporary art as well, in that sort of museum context we're all really familiar with. And on display uh, at the time was an exhibition of Walton Ford's uh, images of animals. So this is his aurochs, and uh, he's an American artist, and he sort of uh, looks at the tradition of natural history and operating in a contemporary art sphere that places a critique on sort of colonialism and imperialism and all sorts of things sort of all that in that space. Uh, now the aurochs, there's a few things here that I need to clarify and why it's important when we work backwards into the form language is the, dy the dynamism of the animal. So you can go to the Royal Easter show and see a Hereford bull and it's kind of like the Vegas Elvis, whereas the aurochs is the young Elvis. Uh, they're a lot leaner, they're more dynamic and vital and so as a symbol of virility and power, they're really important in that sort of Germanic uh, culture. But we can see, you know, cave paintings, this, this animal was uh, celebrated again and again and also the male was huge and much, the female, the herd, was much smaller too, so there's probably a lot of guys thinking, yeah, the aurochs is great. Now, interestingly, and uh, Walton Ford talks about this in relation to this image, uh, there's all of these other sort of wild cattle species around, and the Nazis uh, had interest in this Germanic uh, cultural heritage, and they were trying to recreate the aurochs, which suggests, I know that sort of puts this weird spin on it, it sounds a bit sort of Hollywood, but it shows the cultural power of this animal, and I think if we think of the the symbol of the bull, all of this stuff is familiar territory to us. So whilst on Walton Ford and casting a line to some of the work I've got in the exhibition here, here is uh, his image uh, looking at the thylacine uh, and it's called the island, so he's sort of talking about uh, the impact of the wild animal on sheep farming in Tasmania and so that gives you a whole sort of sense by coming closer to home and territory we understand how he's operating and so a lot of his work takes specific animals from uh, history or particular cultural myths around animals and plays around in that space. Now the other thing then Colin put me onto this uh, one also at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art is a really great uh, collection of work by Asker Jorn, uh, a seminal Danish uh, artist who had a lot of interest in pre-Christian uh, cultures and was associated with Cobra and the Situationist mu movement. And he was also a fierce critic of capitalism. So I think between uh, Jorn and uh, Walton Ford, we talk, talk about this sort of connection to, through the critique of uh, colonialism, understanding of post-colonialist colonialist context uh, and critiquing the Age of Enlightenment, we see this sort of idea of materials and value and ethics come to light. So as a metalsmith, I'm very aware of these things because of, you know, particularly working with precious metals, there's, you know, people that, uh, empires have risen and fallen because of the value that we've placed on those uh, elements. But also I quite like this great image because it introduces the next point. So we've got the uh, human animal happening again. And so all of that happened, those two museum visits in a couple of days uh, in Denmark. And so about a week later, I was in South Korea, in Seoul, and I went to the National Folk Museum, which is on the palace grounds. Anyone who's been to Seoul, it's one of those things you do. Uh, and outside it is this uh, Asian zodiac of all the animals. There's something that everyone gets their photographs taken in front of. I've got them, but I didn't indulge myself and include them. I found another image of someone else doing that, exactly that. Uh, but here we've got this sort of animal-human thing going on. Now what they had on there, which really helped me 
understand what I'd seen in terms of the talisman. So I'd understood the animal informing the tool and the animal inspiring the talisman, but there was something going on between those, and there was an exhibition of uh, shaman's robes at the National Folk Museum. And it was really, because there was a lot of textiles, it was low, the lighting, so it was really atmospheric when you went in there, and this stuff was seriously magical. And I'm saying that with all the cynicism that uh, we can uh, muster in a logical sphere, but also it really moved me. I was in there and it was really spooky. Uh, now, the actual background of the exhibition was uh, this sort of funny title, Path Towards the Cultural Unity of the Peoples of Eurasia. And I was looking at 20, 20 years of uh, political connection between Russia and South Korea, and we know what's sort of sitting there in between. And the collection had come from St. Peter the Great uh, Museum of Anthropo Anthropology, Anthropology and Ethnography. So there was sort of this interest in uh, this the sort of continent of Asia and Russia, and the shaman's costumes came throughout that sort of area. They were from all over the place. And it was interesting sort of linking back to the Viking uh, Scandinavian context, the Volga trade route running right through there, and the silk route as well. So you could see all of this cultural exchange. So when I went right back to that cauldron at the beginning, this sort of idea of national identity, this is busting the Nazis right down here, uh, we could just see it's all in a state of flux. Now I've just, I'm sort of skimming this uh, shaman's robes now, time-wise, but they had all of these amazing charms on them, and they're, they're miniature representations of uh, animals, humans, divinities, uh, the agency of matter in terms of uh, symbolic materials, so whether it was a tooth or a tusk or a piece of coral, there was all of this sort of weird and wonderful stuff there. And it made me think about... Uh, the idea of the objects uh, in terms of ritual, and we think of the shaman and creating meaning through the ritual, and then I started thinking of the actual making of the object as the ritual, and it sort of opened up the idea of uh, authorship, so this idea of collaboration, co-collaboration that you mentioned uh, earlier, Barbara, or uh, interaction with the non-human or more than humans taking place, and the shaman totally embodies that because they're reaching out into the void and pulling those forces that we cannot control or understand into our very presence. And these clothes, they did it. Like, uh, they didn't need the person dancing or singing or any of those things. They did it to me. I was in that room. And it suddenly made me think back to those symbols and the tools and it all started coming together in terms of the agency of matter. Now, I'm going to leave it pretty loose there in that sort of zone, hovering. How am I? Time-wise, yeah, pretty close. But I've just to cast a nice connection right back and uh, bring it back to, to metal as well. We've got some stone moulds, again, from the... We're back in the National Museum of Denmark, and we've got a... Uh, the one on the right here, we've got Thor's hammer and crucifixes being cast in the one mould, so a very uh, entrepreneurial uh, smith at work there, making sure they're keeping their bases covered and the customers broad. But we can see those sort of cultural exchanges there, but we can see the idea of ritual uh, uh, event within cultural history and also the tool and making all operating together. <laughs>